We're going to read today 2 Timothy 1, verses 1 through 7. Second Timothy is the last letter that Paul wrote. Throughout this letter, he's basically reflecting on how this is the end for him and he's going to, he's going to die soon. But uh, it's written to Timothy and that's who we are going to focus on today. See what we can glean here from Timothy. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus, To Timothy, my dear son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God whom I serve, as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, And I am persuaded, now lives in you also. For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. Timothy is talked about a lot. In the Bible, actually, we have two letters that were written to him. And from what we can tell from everything that's written about him, Timothy was not really a likely candidate to be Paul's right-hand man like he was. There were some things about him that, that uh, were not exactly becoming of someone who, of that stature. He was from Lystra, which was in Galatia. His mother was Jewish, but his father was Greek, and that means that uh, he was not exactly a believer. That means he followed pagan traditions and probably pagan gods. He was half Jewish, but he was uncircumcised, Timothy was. So that would normally be something that the father would oversee or or have done, Um, but he was uncircumcised probably because... His father was not a believer. It talks about in our passage here that your mother, Eunice, and your grandmother, Lois, that they were believers, but it doesn't mention his dad. And so it's pretty safe to assume that his dad was not a believer and that he was uncircumcised probably meant that his dad forbade him to be circumcised. That was part of his mom's religion. And he, dad, probably didn't, didn't allow it. So Timothy, he didn't really have a, a good role model for the faith on his, on his dad's side there. So he would have learned scripture from his mother and his grandmother. They would have taken up the responsibility of teaching him that. And this, is, this is a painting by Rembrandt there. And uh, it's, it's his grandmother teaching him the scripture there. That's Timothy. It says in chapter 3, verse 15, From infancy you have known the holy scriptures. So there's a passing reference to how even from when he was a child, he's known the scriptures. So that meant that his grandmother and his mother took it upon themselves themselves to train him in what the Bible said. There were a couple Torah schools out there, but he probably didn't attend one. Those were mostly in Judea, so that was a long ways away. And actually, it was the dad's job in that time to teach the children what the law said. But dad wouldn't have been a believer, and so he would have learned the scriptures from his mom and his grandma. But he was a solid believer and he was recommended by his church. And as such, Timothy became the Apostles Paul's finest helper. Paul actually took him on his second missionary journey. It talks about this in Acts chapter 16. That Paul came to Derbe and then to Lystra where a disciple named Timothy lived. 
whose mother was Jew and a believer, but whose father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke well of him. So he made an impression on the people in his church, and they spoke well of him. And then Paul said, well, I need somebody. Can, uh, can I take him along? So he took him on his second missionary journey, but then also on the third missionary journey, and maybe even the fourth, from what we can tell. Timothy was actually sent to different churches as Paul's representative. He was sent to Thessalonica. He was sent to Corinth, which was a pretty troubled church, and to Philippi, and then to Ephesus. That was a big one. Timothy was left in Ephesus with a particular mission, actually, and that was to stop the influence of false teachers. There were people who were coming up in that church, and they were starting to teach things that weren't correct. And so Paul says, okay, Timothy, I'm going to send you to Ephesus. There's people there that are teaching things that aren't right. I need you to correct them and to make sure that those teachings don't spread around. So that was kind of a tall order for him. Timothy co-wrote six New Testament books. Paul was the primary author in all of them, of course. But Timothy is mentioned in the writing part at the very beginning. In other words, these are the books. This, this is written from both of us. So that would be First and Second Thessalonians, Second Corinthians, Colossians, Philemon, and Philippians. Quite an quite a accomplishment. But he was young. He was probably only somewhere between 30 or 35, something like that, to lead an entire church and to be Paul's representative to all these different churches probably was not, probably was not um, what you would expect from somebody at that age. In 1 Timothy 4, verse 12, Paul actually has to say to him, Do not let anyone look down on you because you are young. But set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. For those of you who are in three point, that's, that's your primary verse there. Don't let people look down on you because you're young. Set an example. So Timothy was probably young. He was also sickly. It says in 5.23, Stop drinking only water and use a little wine because of your stomach and your frequent illnesses. So he was young and he got sick a lot. And one more thing. He was probably also kind of timid. If you read verse 6, or excuse me, verse 7. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power of love and of self-discipline. In verse 6 he says, Fan into flame that gift of God which is in you through the laying out of my hands. He has to encourage him to do that. Timothy is probably a little reserved about his gifts. And Paul's saying, okay, no, nope, fan those into flame. Timidity actually is probably better translated cowardice. Not just a little reserved, but even cowardly. The, the word that Paul uses here is the same one that people use to refer to people who run away in battle when they're supposed to stand and fight. So Paul is concerned also about how Timothy is going to be received in the churches when he's writing to Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians it says, If Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. He was probably a little timid, maybe even a little cowardly. It's easy to do that when you're young and you're not feeling the best all the time. So Timothy isn't exactly somebody that you would probably select necessarily to be Paul's right-hand man. But there were a couple things about Timothy that made him really powerful and effective. He knew the scriptures. 
It says, from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. The Scriptures reveal to us who Jesus Christ is and how we are saved through Him. And when you know that, that is powerful. It's able to make you wise. And it's able to encourage you to teach other people what it really says. No matter how old you are. He knew the Scriptures. Timidity was not an excuse. Timothy was also devoted to sharing Jesus Christ enough even to be circumcised when he was an adult. All the men just cross their legs right now, I imagine. Circumcised as an adult. It says here in Acts chapter 16, verse 3, Paul wanted to take him along on the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. In order to make his witness more powerful to people who were Jewish and who believed in following those traditions, he allowed himself to be circumcised when he was already grown up. That's how devoted he was to spreading the message of Jesus Christ. And not only that, he was very committed to the welfare of others. He cared about other people and he wanted the best for them. Philippians 2, this is your Bible reading track for today. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. For those of you who know Philippians 2 pretty well, right before that, right before he wrote, writes this, Paul gives this big long thing about the attitude of Christ Jesus and how we all need to adopt that. And this, in Christ Jesus, he didn't consider equality with God something to grasp onto and hang onto. He made himself nothing. He took the nature of a servant, made in human likeness, and even suffered death on a cross. And now, in this, this same chapter, just right after that, he talks about Timothy and how he is genuinely interested in your welfare. So in that flow of thought there, he's mentioning Timothy and how he is serving and has genuine interest in your welfare. He didn't use his frequent illnesses as an excuse to not care about other people. Usually when you're sick or you're hurting in some way, you tend to mostly be consumed with the things that you're worried about and your own pain and your own suffering. But Timothy, even though he was frequently ill, he still had genuine concern for other people. That's pretty impressive. I know when I get sick, I tend to mostly think about what I'm feeling and how I can get better. It's a little hard to think about other people, what they're going through. Timothy was still concerned about the welfare of others. In summary, Timothy didn't just know the grace of Christ. He was transformed by it. A lot of us, it's easy to know intellectually that there was Jesus Christ. He died on the cross. He saved us from our sins. He rose again. And he's given us eternal life. We can know that. But to be transformed by that, that's, that's something else. That's something that you spend a whole lifetime doing. When Christ comes into your heart, He transforms you. And Timothy was an example of that. And when you have been transformed by Christ, you are able to set an example for other people. What does it mean to be saved? This is what it means. And when you can set an example, you can lead. 
And the church always needs young leaders like Timothy, people who set an example. So to all of you young people out there, set an example. The church needs you. There's a lot of people in the history of the church who actually were very young when they made a huge difference. Most of you know who Martin Luther is. When he nailed his 95 theses to the door at the church in Wittenberg, he was only 33 years old when he did that. He wasn't 40 or 50 or 60. He was 33. John Calvin, he's the person who anybody who's Reformed or Presbyterian, this is where this, is where this line of thought started here. He wrote this big magnum piece of work called the Institutes of the Christian Religion. And in it, he basically breaks down the Bible. And this is, this is how, how I think about it. And that had a huge, huge influence on the church. He finished that when he was 26. And people still read that in seminary today. I did. There was a man named Hendrik de Kock. Just a long shot. Does anybody know who that is or heard of him before? The Christian Reformed Church today exists probably because of this guy. Back in the Netherlands in 1834, the church was owned by the government and teachings were being watered down. There wasn't really any discipline going on and there were preachers teaching all different kinds of stuff. And this guy said, you know what? We can't be a part of that anymore. And so he and his church decided to separate from the state church. And a ton of other churches joined him, and that started the Christian Reformed Church in the Netherlands. When he did that, he was only 33. How many of you have heard of Albertus Van Ralty? Not that many? Few? Okay. He led his congregation to the United States when he was 35. Timothy's age range here. When he brought all of his congregation to the Netherlands to settle a place that we call Holland, he was 35. How many of you have heard of Johanna Veenstra? Wow. Very good. Johanna Veenstra, she was a Christian Reformed Church young woman, and uh, she had on her heart the people of Nigeria. So she decided to go to Nigeria and just preach the gospel to them there. It was a long voyage, especially back in the early 1900s there. And uh, when she did that, she was only 23. Today, there are more Christian Reformed people in Nigeria than in all of North America. The church always needs young leaders, people who set an example, who know the scriptures, and have a genuine concern of other people's welfare. I'm actually really proud to say that our church has quite a few young leaders too. I'm going to try to avoid naming people. There's quite a few that I could mention here. But we need young leaders who know the scriptures and stand up for truth. In 1 Timothy, it says, Paul is talking to Timothy, he says, I urge you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain men not to teach false doctrines any longer. So Timothy, this young guy, is sent to stop all of this heresy that's springing up within the church. It's quite a tall order. There's a lot of heresy that springs up in the church today too. And we need young people to stand up and say, no, that's not what the scriptures teach. Because I am sick and tired of hearing people say, we need to do this and change this 
and water down this or that because this is what our young people want. That is so not true. We have one of our young people who's actually going to be at the Christian Reformed Church Senate this summer. I was talking with her once and she said she seemed to have a heart for the denomination and the direction that it's going. I said, well, would you be interested in being a young adult representative at Senate? She said, yeah, absolutely. So she's going to go to Senate this summer. Standing up for truth. We need young leaders who commit to serve and bless others. We had a young woman who organized a coat drive here at our church in January. And we collected a bunch of coats and a bunch of people are warm now because of that. Nobody asked her to do that. She just did it. And we have a group that's going on right now. And it's just a bunch of young women that meet together and they study the Bible together. And based from everything I'm hearing about this group, this is really exciting. And it all started back at the serve trip last summer. There were three young women. There was, oh, I won't name names. <laughs> there were three young women there who, um, who were talking and said, but our church doesn't really have a lot for us in our age group. We, we need something. And so they came and they talked to me. And uh, I, I really encouraged them. I said, boy, yeah, we do need something for, for your age group. Um, you know, what can I do to help you? But they took this on uh, upon themselves. There's a group of like 10, 12 young women that meet every month now and they study this book together, they pray together, they pair up and partner up and pray for each other throughout the month. And I'm hearing all kinds of good stuff coming out of this group. There's young women that are excited to grow in their faith. And I didn't do a whole lot. I just encouraged them along on that. If something is lacking in your church, be a part of the solution. There's, our church can always improve. And, and if, you, if you have a burden for something, be a part of the solution. Look at the screen here with me if you would. What do you understand by the communion of saints? First, that believers, one and all, as members of this community, share in Christ and in all His treasures and gifts. Second, that each member should consider it a duty to use these gifts readily and cheerfully for the service and enrichment of the other members. All of you, young and old, are gifted by the Spirit. And because of that, you have things that you can offer us. You might have ideas, you might have insights, you might have just a burden for something that's missing here. I want to encourage you to, if you see something lacking, Take some initiative. Talk to me. We'll see what we can do. And that's because when Jesus saves your life, He also redefines your life. Your life isn't about you anymore. The more you know Jesus Christ, the more you know those scriptures, the more you have a heart for other people and for loving the Lord and committing to serving Him. So seek to learn the ways of Christ over the trends and the patterns of this world. Follow the heart of Jesus instead of what you hear normally follow your own heart. Follow the heart of Jesus and serve over being served. There's times to be served, but there's also times to serve. We need to be able to do both. And so, like Paul encourages Timothy, I want to encourage all of you. If Jesus is Lord in your heart, then fan into flame 
that gift of the Spirit. Fan it, that into flame. That spirit is not a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power and of love that concerns itself with other people and of self-discipline that stands up for the truth of what the Scripture says. Let's bow our heads and let's pray together. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for Jesus Christ who not only saves us but transforms us. Lord, we pray that you would work on each of us so that we would know you more and better realize what your salvation means so that we would seek to spread your good news to others and that we would seek to serve and be a blessing to one another here in this congregation. Lord, help us all to use our gifts to be a blessing to you and to one another. And Lord, may this church bring glory and honor and praise to your name always. Please lead us by your Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.